Many things are happening already, but very few people can see them. Those who claim they can see them have different opinions of what they are. Your opinion about the days we are in might be as important as your destination in eternity. Yes, it is that serious, dear saints. Many believers today are very concerned about the times we are in. Many no longer know where to turn or what to believe. Many are confused and need answers. While one group says we're already living in the last days, others say there is still time, and what we see around us will pass as it has many times before. Some even believe that we have already gone past the last days and might be living in the eternity of heaven and hell already. Which of these ideas is true? What is the truth about the last days the Bible warns us about, and how are we to deal with them today amidst all the confusion? By observing the traffic light's simple operation, there's so much we can learn as Christians about the last days, which goes beyond red means stop, yellow means get ready, and green means go. The traffic light speaks to us every day. Still many of us are too busy to hear what it is saying to us, or we simply ignore it. Jesus instructed his followers about the last days in Matthew chapter 24, verse 33, by saying, Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near, right at the door. Jesus clearly warns us that when we see these things, when they are rampant and spread across every part of the earth, the coming of the Lord is at hand. In this video, I will show you some warning signs every Christian needs to look out for in these last days before the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1-5, through 5, the Bible says, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. The Bible is very clear about the signs we must watch for in the last days. These signs are happening right before our eyes. They are happening around us every day in our homes, offices, communities, and even churches, and we need to pay close attention to them. Number 1. Lovers of Self The Bible says in the last days people will be lovers of themselves. They will only care about themselves. They will be self-centered, self-driven, and self-motivated, and no one else will matter to them. These are people who want everything to revolve around them. They want the spotlight always on them and no one else. You may be asking, but shouldn't people love themselves? Why or when does loving oneself become a problem? We have been wrongly taught about the whole idea of loving ourselves. Some say, if you don't love yourself, nobody will love you. You have to love yourself first before you can properly love others. But what does the Bible say about all this? A Pharisee who was an expert in the Mosaic Law wanted to test Jesus with a question about this in Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 through 40. He said, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. The narrative we have today, even as Christians, is very far from this. Jesus commanded that our love must first be channeled totally to the Lord. Then he pointed out that the commandment says we must love others as much as we love ourselves. You may have seen a Christian gathering or attended meeting where self-love is preached with much authority, and everyone is told to love themselves first. It has to be you first. They emphasize that nobody loves you like you. They use bold commands to drive this message to the people. The people are systematically pushed from the gospel's message, which is built on selflessness, service, and charity. To be Christ-like is to be selfless. It is to be service-minded. It is to become like a servant and not a master. 
Jesus showed us that it is possible to be full of authority, power, and wisdom, and yet be humble enough to love even those undeserving of our love. Love is not love until it gets to those who don't deserve it. Luke chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. Then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Are you a lover of yourself? Are you an advocate of nobody loves you like you? All these are subtle deceptions we must watch out for. Number two, lovers of money. Money is one thing that everyone generally accepts as very important. With money, life is easier. With money, you can afford the good things of life. In fact, every economy around the world has been designed around money. Without money, they would crumble. However, let us see what the Holy Scriptures say about money in the last days. While writing to his son in the faith in 2 Timothy 3, Paul said that in the last days, people would be lovers of money. The phrase, lovers of money here, means people with an insatiable desire for money. Look around you today and see the rate of internet fraud, drug and human trafficking, armed robbery, and many other vices. All these are associated with an uncontrolled love for money. Mammon has become the god of many people, families, and organizations. People worship mammon unknowingly because these are the last days. The Bible tells us that the love of money is the root of all evil. Money is so powerful that Jesus made a very close comparison between God and the spirit behind money. Luke chapter 16 verse 13 says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 also tells us that, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now, you and I can see that it is impossible to serve God in money. What drives you every day as you wake up for work? What's your motivation behind the nine to five race? What is your passion in life? If everything you do is just to earn money, you may have been caught in the last day's deception. You are not only earning a living and not making a life, but Jesus offers us a life that is full of meaning and purpose. Jesus calls us to a life in abundance at its fullest. You can have this kind of life, my friend, Jesus offers it to anyone who comes to ask him for it. Number three, pride. Again, we were warned that in the last days, people will be prouder than ever. They will be proud of their achievements, proud of their wealth, proud of their academic excellence, and proud about almost everything. Why? It is a sign of the last days. But the Bible teaches that pride comes before a fall. So... When pride becomes the identity of the human race, then we are sure that the end is near. James chapter 4, verse 6. But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says God opposes the proud and shows favor to the humble. Pride is one major trap that people easily fall into today. We all want to be perceived as achievers, goal-getters, and excellent people. It is little wonder that, in today's world, everyone flaunts their achievements on social media. In truth, some even do this to intimidate others about their successes. Don't be caught in this trap. Pride is subtle. Pride is a silent destroyer. It can bring down even the most powerful person on earth. The Bible teaches about traits like pride in Song of Solomon chapter 2, verse 15 by saying, Catch for us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards, our vineyards that are in bloom. When our pride is not brought under God, like these little foxes, it will wreak havoc on our destiny. Number four, disobedient to parents. Many today do not see this as a big deal, but it is more than a big deal. More than ever, we see an increase in the rate at which children are disobedient to their parents. They treat their parents without honor or respect. 
Children in this context may mean adults too. The Bible clearly teaches us that we should honor our parents. Still in this modern age, people are advised to only honor those who honor them and respect those who respect them. See what the Bible teaches us about the relationship between children and their parents in Ephesians chapter 6 verses 1 through 3. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Are you obedient to your parents? Have you honored them the way the Bible commands us? Do you know that failure to do this will significantly affect your quality of life in the long run? While we see these happenings, it is not to stir our hearts to fear and despair. Instead, it is to encourage us to be concerned about the last days and live ready while we await the return of our Lord and Savior. We do not operate in fear. Instead, we are encouraged to work in love while we diligently obey the bidding of our Lord. You will never be in fear if you live according to Scripture. Fear about the things happening in these last days comes from a heart that does not obey the Word of God. Pay careful attention to the Word. Do the Word. Live the Word. Pray. And stay on course with the Word of God. And you will be operating in love and boldness. You will no longer be tossed to and fro by the wind. You will not be carried away with the deception of the last days. Jesus tells his church in Revelation chapter 22 verses 12 through 15 that, Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Finally, seeing that we have been clearly warned that deception will be widespread in the last days, Christians must not fall prey to these deceptions. We must be intelligently sensitive to what the Bible calls us to pay attention to. We must heed the Lord's instructions and be ready to stay on the right track irrespective of the devil's deceptions, schemes, and tricks to lead us astray. Something is happening, and very few people, including Christians, are aware of it. Treat this as an emergency message, dear child of God. And if you haven't received God's free gift of salvation, please don't finish this video without making that decision today. You may have heard that we are in the last days from numerous sources, including past videos from us. We are not going to stop announcing it until everyone hears it and prepares their heart for what is already happening and what is still to come. Do you know that the book of Revelation, specifically many of the things spoken of in the book of Revelation, are already taking place, unfolding one by one right before our very eyes? Although many of the prophecies and messages of this prophetic book are symbols of past, present, and future occurrences, some of its truths are quite clear and agree with many other prophetic books of the Bible. Once upon a time, there were things we only thought would happen in the future, but they are already happening. This in itself is a sign that we are in the end of our time on Earth. Think about the news of wars ending and wars starting, diseases, disasters, deaths, corruption, and aggression. Many may say none of these are new and that they have come and gone before. But if you study history, although much of such may have happened in the past, they have never been of the same magnitude as what we have today. Could in almost all the continents of the world there have been a wave of fear, conflict between nations, plans for conflicts at a global scale, division of nations, natural disasters, diseases and economic and democratic breakdowns all at the same time? I strongly doubt it. What do you think? The book of Revelation talks about four important seals, each represented by a horseman showing different catastrophic events that will happen during the end times. Seal, known as suffragus in Greek, could only be broken by the one who has authority over it. In breaking the seals and disclosing God's judgments, Christ demonstrated his own divine authority over creation. 
These seals, according to the Word of God, would be opened by the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ Himself, leading to divine judgment on earth. Here is what it says about the first seal and its connection to the first horseman. Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 through 2. Then I saw as the Lamb, Christ, broke one of the seven seals of the scroll initiating the judgment. And I heard one of the four living creatures call out as with a voice of thunder, Come! I looked and behold the white horse of victory, whose rider carried a bow, and a crown of victory was given to him. And he rode forth conquering and to conquer. The Bible tells us that the first seal will reveal a rider on a white horse, which can mean conquest or warfare. Some schools of thought believe this figure is a false peace bringer, connected to the rise of the Antichrist. It represents a time of great deception, where evil pretends to be good and the world is led astray. This sets the stage for the other seals, but doesn't it sound like everything you may have been hearing or hope to hear soon? Maybe you hope that one day someone would rise or something would happen that would turn the hearts of all warring nations toward each other and everyone would sit at the same table and end all conflicts. If this happens now, the Bible is telling us that it would be a false sense of peace. This means that it would give way to the appearance of the Antichrist who would bring about the Great Tribulation, the mark of the beast and the great war between good and evil. But the Bible doesn't stop there. We also see a second seal. What could this seal be? Still in Revelation chapter 6, verses 3 through 4, When he, the Lamb, broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature call out, Come, and another, a fiery red horse of bloodshed came out, and its rider was empowered to take peace from the earth, so that men would slaughter one another, and a great sword of war and violent death was given to him. In the last days, when the Lamb of God breaks the second seal, something else will manifest itself. The Bible says that the second seal will bring a rider on a red horse, symbolizing bloodshed and violence. War will intensify, causing suffering and loss of life. Peace will seem to vanish from the earth. So, although the world will think they are at peace and there is no need to fear the judgment of God, it would actually result in the second judgment, wars, bloodshed, and destruction on a massive scale. Right now when you watch the news, doesn't it bring the question that, is it possible we are already seeing these seals being broken right before our very eyes? Could it get any worse than it already is? These are deep things that only wise believers would take to heart, but those who are sleeping or blind to spiritual things would simply brush them off as nothing. Now, going further, the Bible mentions the third seal and its horsemen. Revelation chapter 6, verses 5 through 6 says, When he, the Lamb, broke open the third seal, I heard the third living creature call out, Come! I looked, and behold the black horse of famine, and the rider had in his hand a pair of scales, of balance. And I heard something like a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, a day's wages, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not damage the oil and the wine. The rider on a black horse signifies scarcity and an economic crisis. Isn't this more apparent by the day? Food is getting more and more scarce and expensive. Things are getting more and more difficult for everyone, rich and poor alike. And then the fourth seal will be opened. Revelation chapter 6 verses 7 through 8. When he, the Lamb, broke open the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature call out, Come! So I looked, and behold, an ashen horse, pale greenish gray, like a corpse, representing death and pestilence, and its rider's name was Death, and Hades, the realm of the dead, was following with him. They were given authority and power over a fourth part of the earth, to kill with the sword and with famine and with plague, pestilence, disease, and by the wild beasts of the earth. This seal presents a pale horse, ridden by death, accompanied by Hades. This indicates death and destruction that will come in various ways, and the fifth seal will be broken. Revelation chapter 6 verses 9 through 11 says, When he, the Lamb, broke open the fifth seal, 
I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slaughtered because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained out of loyalty to Christ. They cried in a loud voice saying, O Lord, holy and true, how long now before you will sit in judgment and avenge our blood on those unregenerate ones who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and they were told to rest and wait quietly for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers and sisters who were to be killed even as they had been would be completed. When the Lamb opens the fifth seal, it will reveal the souls of believers who were killed for their faith in Christ. Oh, they cry out for justice and are given white robes, waiting until others join them. The last, the sixth seal, is when there'll be a great cosmic disturbance, including powerful earthquakes, a darkened sun, and a blood-red moon. People, including kings, world leaders, politicians, and ordinary folks will try to hide from God's wrath. Revelation, chapter 6, verses 12 through 17. I looked when he, the lamb, broke open the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as a sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth like a fig tree shedding its late summer figs when shaken by a strong wind. The sky was split, separated from the land, and rolled up like a scroll, and every mountain and island were dislodged and moved out of their places. Then the kings of the earth and the great men and the military commanders and the wealthy and the strong and everyone, whether slave or free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they called to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the righteous wrath and indignation of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath and vengeance and retribution has come. And who is able to face God and stand before the wrath of the Lamb? These verses center on how kings, nobles, mighty men and people from all walks of life respond to the events happening around them. They try to escape from the Lamb's wrath and the day of his judgment, fully aware of the seriousness and impending consequences for the world. This crucial verse reveals profound insights into human nature. It becomes evident that people are not oblivious to the turmoil. Rather, we observe a notable shift in their behavior and attitude towards God. As the world faces the severe consequences of God's judgment, everyone from powerful rulers to the weakest souls knows that His wrath is coming. Their reaction is one of desperation, begging the mountains to fall on them, seeking shelter from God's anger and the Lamb's judgment. Surprisingly, they would rather face an avalanche than bear the weight of God's judgment. The painful thing about this is that even now, despite acknowledging God's supremacy, people stubbornly refuse to follow His rules. The approaching catastrophe leaves no space for denial or escape forcing everyone to face an unavoidable truth. They are accountable to their Creator. However, amid this revelation, we find the disheartening reality that just knowing about God's sovereignty doesn't automatically lead to true faith or sincere repentance. Throughout the scriptures, we come across similar instances where people recognize God's existence and authority, but they still fail to surrender their lives to Him. But Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 makes the distinction between those who know and those who go on to put their faith in Him. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. The human heart tends to rebel and rely on itself, even in the face of God's judgment. This shows that the true faith requires a change of heart and a willingness to fully follow God's will. Just knowing about God isn't enough. Genuine repentance and surrender are essential to connect with Him. Many people today know God exists and that He will judge them one day. They understand that hell is a real place of eternal suffering. Despite this knowledge, some still reject God and His Word. We read in Revelation how people will experience God's wrath but instead of turning to Him, they will try to hide. Some think if given a chance, people in hell would repent, but some just hate Jesus and want nothing to do with God. Our world is changing, and many are turning away from God, calling evil good and good evil. Some love their sins more than God, which is a problem. Sin can be enticing, 
leading people away from God. As believers, we must resist these temptations and let our lives show God's transformative power. We should pray for those who don't know Christ, just as the martyred souls in Revelation cried out for justice. We must pray for God's love and truth to touch their hearts, leading them to repentance. In conclusion, let's not be distracted by the changing world, but anchor ourselves in God's unchanging truth. As the world rejects God more, we must rely on His guidance to stand firm in our faith. We should live obediently to Christ, showing His love to others and being agents of hope in a world that needs Jesus' saving grace. 2 Corinthians 11, 13-16 For such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising, then, if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. Dear friends, are you aware that the biblical prophecies about the last days are being revealed in our time? The revelation of these prophecies points to one thing, which is the second coming of Christ. And who is He coming for? His glorious church. Not a building. Neither one hut in the most remote village or one megachurch in the largest city. But people, you and me, who believe in Jesus Christ and live in His grace by faith. This is no surprise to any believer in Christ. However, it may take people unaware because many people will be deceived and will forget the Lord's promise about His return to take us home. Jesus told His followers that in the last days there will be impostors falsely claiming to be the Messiah and that false prophets will arise performing great and mind-blowing miracles, signs and wonders to lead many people astray, even the very elect of God. The Word of God also tells us that even Satan transforms himself to appear as an angel of light. So it's no wonder that his servants also go about pretending to be the ministers of righteousness. We've been clearly warned that in the last days, deception will be rampant, and as believers, we should not fall prey to this deception. What kind of deception is this? In this video, I'll be sharing two major kinds of deceptions Jesus warned his followers about in the last days. The first deception we were warned about are false messiahs. You may ask, false messiahs? How would anyone even believe such a ridiculous idea? But if it were not possible, we wouldn't have been warned about their activities by the Lord himself. False messiahs are people that claim to be Christ. They go on to perform signs and wonders and propagate deceptive teachings. Their goal is to lead many further away from the truth. Every now and then, someone claims to be the reincarnation of Jesus. A few of these individuals even have appearances similar to popular artistic renderings of Jesus while he was on earth. These Jesus reincarnated claimants gain large numbers of followers who innocently spread their messages they're eventually exposed as the frauds and charlatans that they are. It's too hard to maintain the appearance of a perfect life. How should you and I as Christians respond when someone claims to be Jesus or from Jesus? Jesus did not leave us to guess our way through questions and thoughts such as this. He specifically gave us direct answers about these occurrences. Matthew 24, 23 to 27 at that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you ahead of time. So if anyone tells you there he is out in the wilderness, do not go out. Or here he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. This is very clear for us concerning how we should approach questions concerning false messiahs. The instruction is simple. Do not believe. The Bible has made it clear to us that the coming of the Son of Man will not be hidden. Test all spirits. Don't just believe someone because they claim to be from God. Believe them 
because they glorify Jesus and the Holy Spirit convinces you about them. False messiahs can be recognized by paying attention to the words of the Lord. Some have cunningly deceived many through signs, wonders, and miracles, and have tricked many to stray from the way of salvation and obedience to the Lord. Some have professed new religions or new philosophies that further deceive many into all forms of evil. But the advice of the Lord remains firm, that many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. The second deception is the increase of false prophets. You may be wondering, but there's been such an increase in knowledge, insight, and deep revelations. Why would anyone fall for false prophets and their cheap prophecies? Listen to what the Lord said again in Matthew 7, 15. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. Who is a false prophet? A false prophet is anyone who heralds, spreads, or propagates false teachings while claiming to speak the words of God. False prophets are representatives of false gods. They are ambassadors of falsehood. They do not have the truth in them and cannot lead anyone to the truth. Their primary assignment is to ensure that they lead many into deception that will lead to destruction. Jeremiah 14, 14 says, Then the Lord said to me, The prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I have not sent them or appointed them or spoken to them. They are prophesying to you false visions, divinations, idolatries, and the delusions of their own minds. Therefore, this is what the Lord says about the prophets who are prophesying in my name. I did not send them, yet they're saying, No sword or famine will touch this land. Those same prophets will perish by sword and famine. God says that these false preachers are liars and that they profane the name of the Lord by telling false visions. Their teachings and sermons are products of sheer illusions that stem from the hearts of evil desires. They were born in lies, and their source is from the realm of darkness. They and their practices are detestable before the Lord. Here are a few characteristics to watch out for in false prophets in these last days, my friend. The first thing we must watch for in false prophets is that they don't recognize Jesus Christ as divine. No false prophet can truly hide this fact about their beliefs. Believers in these last days must carefully examine and determine who false prophets are from what they say. As we listen carefully, we'll see that they do not acknowledge that Jesus is God. This is exactly how every believer will know the difference between genuine and false prophets. The spirit at work in false prophets is the spirit of deceit which ensnares them into deception. 1 John 4, 3 But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. Secondly, when watching for false prophets, we must see their inconsistency with the Scripture. False prophets are never consistent in their dealings, especially when interpreted in the light of the Scripture. No true prophecy comes from human initiative, but is inspired by the moving of the Holy Spirit upon those who speak a message from God. This is why any deviation from Scripture should make believers wary. Lastly, one of the characteristics of false prophets is that their teachings will promote immoral behavior. Because the spirit at work in them is the spirit of error and deceit, they usually lead people astray to live a life that's full of immorality and promotes godless living. They make people feel that a life of total obedience to the laws of God is not necessary. They may justify this because, after all, our God is a loving God. They misinterpret the love of God and ignore God's total hatred for evil. They make carnality look very much like spirituality. From such, we must be very careful and run away as fast as we can so that we aren't trapped. Apostle Peter warned the church about false prophets and their nefarious conduct in 2 Peter 2, 1-3. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, 
even denying the sovereign lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. The Bible warns us that because of these false prophets, many will follow immoral lifestyles. In their cunning arguments, they fabricate lies that promote a life of disobedience to the laws of God and speak against anything that promotes a life of consecration and devotion to God. We have been cautioned by our Lord about the deception of the last days by false messiahs and false prophets. Believers are not only called to a life of obedience, but also have been called to a life of high spiritual vigilance. This will shield us from deception and provide us with the wisdom for overcoming deception. Finally, my friends, as we live our day-to-day -day lives in total submission to God, let us not forget the warnings of the Lord in Matthew 7, 19-23. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. I never knew you. Why will the Lord say that? Is the Lord partial about this? No. The greatest concern about this passage is that people will have prophesied exercise demons, and perform many miracles, yet the Lord does not know them. There was never a time they came to acknowledge the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, yet they went on to work for the Master. This is similar to taking an exam in school you were never admitted into. It sounds ridiculous. However, this is the regretful end of every untrue Christian, including every false prophet and messiah who does not repent to surrender their heart genuinely to the Lord Jesus for pardon. Jesus calls every one of us. He's full of love and compassion and is willing to accept us in spite of our wrongdoings and free us from the shackles of pride, self, and sin to become his dear children. Will you accept him today? We are living in the last days. In fact, we've probably been in this period for years. Most people are in denial about this because all they can think about is the end of the world and Christ's return. Although it really is about that, we tend to overlook the fact that we have a certain set of responsibilities to fulfill at this time. The word last does not mean that the end is in a few months or years. It simply means that we're living in the indefinite number of days God has allotted before his day of judgment. The problem is that humans see this as a glass half empty type of thing. We anticipate the end more than the time we have left to carry out the instructions God has given us. We focus more on the reward of standing before Christ than his instructions on how to live in these last days. It's focusing only on the destination and not paying attention to the journey it takes to get there. Matthew 24, 43 through 44 says, But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. We pour all our energy into getting ready, which involves asking for repentance and performing good acts. However, there is more to God's return than just these two things. As followers, our role today is more pressing than ever. We are not called to relax just because God is about to fetch us. We are tasked to do the opposite. As you finish this message, you will know how our Father really wants us to live in these last days. Let's get on with it. Firstly, live these days in anticipation and glee. 1 John 3, 2 reads, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, 
but we know that when he appears we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. Imagine seeing the Most High God, the Creator of heaven and earth, the One who made all things beautiful, the Father who sustained you and fought all your battles with you. Tell me, is there anything else more important and exciting than this? 1 Peter 1, 5 states, And through your faith, God is protecting you by His power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. My brothers and sisters, the day where your faith is rewarded is nearing. Your obedience, hard work, and resilience as a follower are seen, and He is about to fulfill His promise of eternal life. We've been looking forward to the Day of Judgment since the day we were baptized. I'm telling you, this is our time to shine. Psalm 37:29 also says that the righteous will possess the earth and they will live forever on it. Admittedly, we can never achieve full righteousness, but the important part is that we try every day. We devote ourselves to being better followers than yesterday, don't we? Have you ever seen how a dog behaves whenever its owner comes home? Their level of excitement is truly unmatched. They can't stay still. Their tails wag like crazy and they usually cry out in glee. This is because one of their sources of happiness is being in the company of their owner, who loves and cares for them deeply. Dogs are very social creatures. When their owners aren't around, all they do is wait for them to come back. We should learn to be as excited as them, for our Creator is coming back too. And for us, we are set to live in God's presence very soon. If fear conquers you rather than excitement, it speaks a lot about your lack of confidence in the sanctification God has given to you. It suggests that you're not ready to let go of the material things here on earth for eternal life. Do not let Satan's influence destroy you at the last minute. I want to take this moment to remind you that God's return is our end game. It's our finish line here on earth right before we live a new life in God's kingdom. So let us gleefully await the Most High. Next, he wants us to strengthen our grip on the gospel of Christ. In Mark 13, 10, God explicitly instructs us with this, and the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Just because Jesus is coming doesn't mean that the fight is over. In these last days, the Lord wants us to strengthen our commitment to heeding and sharing the gospel. One of the primary reasons can be found in 2 Peter 3.3. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. The forces of evil will put up a fight and double their efforts to influence more people, knowing how the devil greatly competes with God. We should take note that he will work harder, especially now that Judgment Day is coming. The enemy wants to displease the Lord by showing him that his people do not revere him. It's our obligation as representatives of God to combat such wicked plans, and we do this by seeking his kingdom further. I'm sure you're aware that we are currently living in a very challenging reality. There are crimes and disasters left and right. Wars are not resolved and disobedience often goes unpunished. This is the harsh truth. The world is fading away. And for this reason, we must work harder to spread the gospel so that our loved ones won't fade with the world too. The word of God is unchanging. It is the only thing that can help prepare humanity for his arrival. As said by Joyce Meyer, the rapture is the ultimate expression of God's love for his people. Before we finally experience this, the people need to know that there is something glorious waiting for them. They need to know that the rapture is not the end, but rather the beginning of all things new and pleasing. Believe it or not, we are entitled to act as shepherds. Our grasp of God's commands makes us qualified to guide our neighbors to the way to eternal life. When a president visits a foreign country, 
do you think the authorities of the latter sit nonchalantly and just go with the flow? They do everything they can to accommodate the president in the best way possible. They obtain information on the president's interests, hobbies, allergies, preferences, and everything else that they can dig up just to make sure that the visit will be very pleasant. In the same way, as we wait for the Lord's return, we are also encouraged to further broaden our knowledge and feed our spiritual selves. We strive to learn more about Him and His Word so that when the time comes, we are fully prepared and knowledgeable about what can happen. There is no fear when you know you're ready. To sum it up, we need to hold on to the Word of God more strongly than ever in order to fight the evil forces and show how loyal we are to our Father until the end of time. The last piece of advice is to achieve a united front with the church and the people. God returns to everyone who believes in Him and accepts Him as their Savior, not only to those who did it first. I'm going to be honest here. Some Christians tend to be selfish and self-righteous. There is a notion that because they've been serving the Lord for a long time, they don't really need to care about non-believers anymore. They might think, well, that's their choice and they're about to get what they deserve. They are convinced that the end is near and so they drop their responsibilities as a disciple and think, I've done my part, goodbye. Let us recall Jesus' crucifixion. Remember the thief on the cross? That thief asked for repentance even though it seemed too late. He was so close to death, already crucified, and the whole nation knew him for his sins. He repented, and Jesus told him not to worry, for he had earned a place in paradise. I want you to really think about God's love here. Salvation is not on a first-come, first-served basis. When Christians gloat and delight in the idea that they already have a spot in heaven, we need to think more about those who haven't turned their backs on the world yet. It's not our task to judge who is worthy of eternal life and who isn't. But it is our job to make sure that everyone is well informed about our Father's generosity. Everyone needs to know that they still have a chance to repent and that there's no shame in doing so. The fight isn't over until God declares it so. Having said this, we need to be more dedicated to spreading the gospel. We have to work towards unity and encourage each other, Christians or not. Aside from this, unity will be essential as we live in an environment where evil forces seem to dominate. Critical times hard to deal with will be here, for men will be lovers of themselves lovers of money, disobedient to parents, without self-control, fierce, without love of goodness, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. 2 Timothy 3, 1-5 The rapture will inevitably cause panic among a lot of people, Christians included, as part of being united in 1 Thessalonians 4, 18. We are asked to Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Amidst the chaos and fear, we have to share the peace God has put in our hearts. These are three pieces of advice on living in the last days derived from God's word. Are you incorporating all of these into your daily life? Let's make an effort to do so, and I assure you that your effort will not go unseen. Check in with your brothers and sisters in Christ and assess how they feel about the rapture and the fact that we are living in the end times. Share what you know. Seek what you have yet to learn and maintain a hopeful and excited spirit. The Lord will be pleased to know that you're carrying out your responsibilities diligently. Together, we look forward to the day our Father Almighty fulfills His promise of eternal life to His children. In the last days, Jesus calls us to live with an attitude of wisdom. You see, we have spent enough of our past lifetime walking in the ways of the world, in lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. But now, as Christians, we are called to live differently. Peter realized this 
and he urged us to stop being double-minded and start living fully devoted to God. Imagine you're on a journey, and the road behind you is littered with the mistakes and sins of the past. But here's the good news. Jesus offers you a new path, a fresh start, and the opportunity to leave that old life behind. It's time to embrace the transformative power of God's grace and step into a life of righteousness. Peter points out that some may find it strange that we don't run with them in the same flood of dissipation. But remember, my friends, we are not called to blend in with the world. We are called to stand out as lights in the darkness. And yes, this may invite criticism and even hostility from those around us, but fear not, for our ultimate accountability is to the one who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Now, let's take a closer look at this list of sins. Lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. It's striking how relevant these issues are even in today's world. It shows us that fallen humanity hasn't made much progress over the centuries. But remember, in Christ, we are given the strength to overcome these temptations. God's Word is a compass guiding us through life's turbulent seas. It points us toward the path of righteousness, protecting us from the dangers of sin. So, let's anchor ourselves in the truth of Scripture and allow it to lead us into the fullness of life that God intends for us. You may be wondering, why not just enjoy the pleasures of the world before fully committing to godliness? Well, my friends, that's a tragic misconception. God's ways are higher and more satisfying than anything the world has to offer. Living in godliness and obedience to His Word brings us true joy and fulfillment, not fleeting pleasures that lead to regret. Remember, we are not alone on this journey. God's Word tells us that the Gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that they might live according to God in the Spirit. This reminds us that our choices have eternal consequences, and we must strive to live a life that honors God. So, my dear brothers and sisters, let's embrace the wisdom of Jesus and live with purpose in these last days. Let's be a beacon of hope in a dark world, showing others the transformative power of Christ's love. As we walk this path of righteousness, let's encourage one another and bear witness to the hope that resides within us. Remember, the words of Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Let this verse be a constant reminder that with Christ by our side, we can navigate these last days with courage and grace. May His teachings empower us, inspire us, and lead us to live a life that brings glory to His name. Do not be discouraged. The world around us may seem chaotic, with wars, conflicts, natural disasters, and uncertainties knocking on our doors. But take heart. In Matthew chapter 24, verses 6 through 8, Jesus foretells of such challenging times, reminding us that they are just the beginning of sorrows. Amidst these tribulations, He urges us not to be troubled. Instead, fix our eyes on Jesus, the anchor of your soul, and the hope that never fades. Yes, the news might be alarming, and the future may seem uncertain, but remember, you are not alone. God is still on the throne, and His promises endure forever. So. When fear comes knocking, remind yourself that the Creator of the universe holds you in His loving embrace. Do not lose heart, for the Lord is with you every step of the way. Now, let's move on to our second point. Stay rooted in God's Word. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 35, Jesus reminds us, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. The Bible is an unshakable foundation in a world full of shifting sands. It contains the very teachings of Christ, offering us divine wisdom and guidance for navigating the challenges of these last days. Make it a daily habit to immerse yourself in Scripture, for it is like a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. It reveals God's character, His promises, and His unwavering love for His creation. As you build your life upon the eternal truths found in the Bible, you will find strength, peace, and purpose that transcends the turmoil of the world. In these last days, when the world may grow colder and hearts become hardened, Jesus calls us to be beacons of His love. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 12, He warns that because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but you can make a difference. 
Reach out to those in need, show kindness to strangers, and forgive us as you have been forgiven. Let love be the guiding force that shapes your actions, words, and thoughts. By shining the light of Christ's love, you can bring hope and healing to a hurting world. Be watchful and prayerful. Jesus implores us to be vigilant, just as the wise servant who keeps watch for the master's return. We do not know the hour or the day when the Lord will come again, but we can prepare our hearts by seeking him in prayer and meditating on his word. Prayer is a powerful connection to the divine, a direct line to the Almighty. Through prayer, we find solace, seek guidance, and experience the transformative presence of God. Let your prayers be a continuous conversation with the one who knows you intimately and cares for your every need. Remembering the words of Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Embrace these teachings and may the love and wisdom of Jesus Christ illuminate your path as you journey through these last days. Keep your eyes fixed on Him, for He is the way, the truth, and the life. The end of all things is at hand, and we stand at the threshold of eternity. Knowing this truth should ignite a fire within us, compelling us to earnestly seek the Lord in prayer. Our prayer life is not just a routine. It's a lifeline connecting us to the source of strength and wisdom. So let's take a moment to be serious and watchful in our prayers, recognizing that Jesus could come at any time. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7 says, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. You see, it's not enough to simply believe that Jesus is coming soon. Our beliefs must transform into actions. Jesus calls us to love one another fervently. Love has the power to cover a multitude of sins, mending broken relationships and fostering unity within our community of believers. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8 says, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Hospitality, a beautiful expression of love, opens doors to hearts and homes. Let's be hospitable without grumbling, for it's in those moments of service that we truly reflect the heart of Christ. Remember, love is not just a feeling. It's a decision we make to put others before ourselves. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 9 says, Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Now, let's talk about the gifts God has given us. Each one of us possesses unique talents, and it's essential to use them to bless others. Whether it's speaking, teaching, or serving, our goal should be to glorify God in all we do. You know, living in the last days might seem daunting, but it's also a time of great opportunity. We have the chance to be beacons of hope and light in a world that desperately needs it. By living with purpose, love, and a heart devoted to prayer, we can impact lives and bring glory to God. Matthew chapter 24, verse 44. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 2. Take heed that no man deceive you. Now, those words take heed mean to pay attention, to look intently into something. It's like a warning sign that Jesus is putting up for us, urging us to be alert, to stay awake, and to pay close attention. And why is that? It's to ensure that we don't fall into the traps of deception laid out by the enemy. You see, one of the sneakiest things about deception is that often, those who are deceived don't even realize it. It's like being caught in a hidden snare, unaware of the danger that surrounds us. And that's why Jesus wants us to be vigilant. He wants us to protect ourselves and stay grounded in the truth. Sadly, we've seen it happen. Many have drifted away from the true teachings of Christ, entangled in the lies and false doctrines propagated by others. But remember, this was foretold in the Bible. It's not a surprise. People will be led astray, following strange doctrines and losing their way. We witness it today as some churches openly promote things that go against God's word. Now. Let me share with you a verse that perfectly aligns with what we're talking about. It's 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, which says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. This is a clear warning, my friends. But fear not, we can protect ourselves. 
So how can we shield ourselves from deception? Immerse yourself in the Word of God. Read the Bible, meditate on it, and let its truth sink in deep into your heart. Know what God says so you can spot the lies. Pray. Prayer is like putting on spiritual armor, protecting us from the enemy's attacks. Jesus himself warned, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Oh, you've seen it happen throughout history and even now. People making grandiose claims, claiming to be Christ or promising miracles for a price. Let me tell you, my friends, God's blessings are not for sale. You know, Jesus compared the last days to the time of Noah, where people went about their daily routines, unaware of the impending flood. So stay alert and watchful. Surround yourself with a community of believers who can support and encourage you on this journey. Remember, we have the Holy Spirit within us, guiding us into all truth. So lean on Him, seek His guidance, and stay anchored in Christ. The enemy's deception may be strong, but the power of God's truth is stronger.